Y'all are crazy. It's good to see you guys. How are you doing? Good? All right. Good, good, good. Hey, I wanted to mention one thing real quick before we get rolling. This week, uh, so let me back up a little bit. When we started the year, we started with a Bible reading plan, right? We said we're going to read through uh, most of the Bible in a year. So it skips some things, the plan we put out skips a few things like genealogies and some things like that. Not that they're not important, they're absolutely important. But anyway, uh, over the pandemic, we were we had to stop meeting for home groups for a little while. And what we were doing in home groups was going over that Bible reading plan. And so we were unable to do that for just a little bit. And um, so I understand that what that could lead to is maybe uh, many who were able to keep up with it and home group kind of served as a reminder uh, and then just your whole schedule's been thrown out of whack that maybe it's been a little harder to keep up with it. Maybe you're behind, all right? No, uh, no condemnation here. If you are behind, not a big deal. But what I want to encourage you with is this. On Wednesday, I believe, or Thursday, the New Testament starts, all right, on this reading plan. So the reading plan can be accessed outside of here in the lobby area. We've got paper copies of that that you can pick up and take home with you. Uh, but you can access it on our website also. Uh, each day there's a portion there where you can just click the, the tab and it'll take you to today's readings and you can read that. But I encourage you to at least jump back in, whether you've been reading with us or not, whether you're behind or not, um, jump into it now and let's finish out the year by reading the New Testament together. How about that? Sound good? I think we can all do that. And uh, as a when, Lord willing, uh, and the COVID don't rise, right? When, um, when we are able to start meeting again for home groups in a way that uh, certainly is more inclusive for everyone and everyone's comfortable doing that, uh, which probably would be early September, that'll be when that semester is going to start anyway, uh, we will begin just probably by picking up with that Bible reading plan. So you can go ahead and get on track with that. I encourage you to be reading that over the next few weeks. Uh, and let's see what the Lord's got going on in the New Testament. Cool. All right. So my name's Kyle. I meant to introduce myself. Jasper did that for me. Uh, but if you are visiting, I too want to say thank you for being here. If you're visiting online, which sounds kind of odd, but if you are online and you're watching for the first time, thank you uh, for joining us. We are going to be in Psalm 117 today. So we're continuing our Psalm series, which the whole purpose of Psalm, this Psalm series is to align ourselves with God's heart. All right, how many of you know it's important to align yourself with the heart of God, right? Okay, two of you are in on this. Or, this is a start, you know, it's a start. Uh, Jesus had 12, I've got two, so here we go. Um, so, so, that's hilarious. All right, funnier than you thought it was. But anyway, so we are aligning ourselves with God's heart. This is what we're doing even as Christians daily. Whether you're aware or not of what's happening in your heart daily, uh, if you are in Christ and you are pursuing Him to at least some level, God is, through His Spirit, aligning you with Himself. Amen? This is called sanctification. It's the getting rid of the old man and the taking on the new man. It's becoming more and more like the image of Christ Jesus. And this is the goal of Christianity. It's to be more and more like the one whom we know and love and believe in. So that's why we're reading Psalms. That's why we're going through Psalms. We want to align ourselves with God's heart. Now today, I want to introduce, well, it's not really introducing, uh, but I want to examine the word, for a moment anyway, doxology. Now, doxology is something you are aware of. Doxology is typically the name of a song we sing, right? We just sang called New Doxology. I believe that was the name of it. Yes, all right, cool. And so I'm terrible at song names. Love music. Can't remember song names to save my life. So, but we just sang New Doxology. Now, this is different than, um, uh, not different, sorry. That's not different than doxology. It's just a way of expressing Doxology. Let me explain that more here in just a moment, but before we begin, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you, and I thank you, Lord, for this moment we have now to be in your word. I pray, Lord, that you would unite us together under your word, that you would speak through your word now to our hearts. Holy Spirit, open the eyes of our heart to understand and to see and to know who is this God that we are studying 
Help us to be in love with him ferociously. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So doxology comes from the ancient Greek word doxologia. Doxologia. Doxo there means glory. That's what doxo means. It's glory. Logia means to communicate, or it is communications of divine origin. So when we're saying doxology or doxologia, what we're saying is, is that it's the act of communicating divine glory. It's a statement. It's often a song. It's something about the divine glory. So doxology, as we know it today, is the song or praise of God. It's, it's some kind of writing. It's something, a statement saying we're praising the Lord. Now, you typically find doxologies in Scripture, and they typically come at the end of some profound understanding of God and His character. So the way it'll kind of go is you'll read some writings, and it's really amazing, and then the writer will just kind of end with something about praising the Lord because of all of this thing. I can't imagine what it was like, first of all, to be the one penning this, inspired by the Holy Spirit. These men who were inspired by the Holy Spirit writing these sacred writings down that were going to exist for all time. Amen? And as you're writing those things down, you just recognize that this is otherworldly. You couldn't help but like stop and just praise the Lord. And even that praise of the Lord is inspired by God. Amen? Cool. And so... Here's some examples. In response to the birth of Christ, angels appear and they say, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. That is doxology. Another one comes in Romans 11. Paul just spent 11 chapters declaring the goodness of God in salvation by grace to both Jews and Gentiles. And he writes this, Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments. How inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Or who has given to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. That is doxology. One of my favorites, I'll mention one more just by way of example, comes at the end of the book of Jude. Jude is about persevering in the faith in difficult times. It's a great book to read now, but it specifically is talking about uh, even the difficulties that come from having false teachers all around. Again, very prevalent for today. And it says this, it says, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forever. Amen. In the Old Testament scriptures, the Israelites are using doxology to recall the goodness of God toward them throughout their history. So you see a theme developing. Doxology is praise of God as a response to understanding exactly who God is and what he is like. That is called theology. It's the study of God. It's to find out who God is. It's learning about him. And when you do theology, when you do study of God, when you learn more about him and his character and his goodness, you are drawn into praise. You want to praise the Lord more deeply. You long to praise him more passionately because you see him so much more uh, in so much more fullness than you had seen him previously there's a pastor and christian hip-hop artist which obviously makes him far more cool than myself who said this his name's shy lynn he says during the introduction of one of his songs called doxology he says theology is the study of god and it's very important doxology is an expression of praise to god so the point here is that all theology should ultimately lead to doxology. That's right. There are Christian hip-hop songs that are talking about God in such a magnificent way. He goes on to say, if theology doesn't lead to doxology, then we've actually missed the point of theology. So if you have theology without doxology, you just have dead, cold orthodoxy. He goes on to say, which is horrible, right? On the other side, we have people who say, ugh. Forget 
theology. I just want to praise or I just want to learn or whatever. But he goes on to say, if we have doxology without theology, we actually have idolatry. He goes on to explain it this way. It's just a random expression of praise. It's not actually informed by the truth of who God is. So that makes it idolatry. It's praise for praise itself. You're praising praise. That's idolatry. That's the definition of it. So God is concerned with both, he goes on to say. He's concerned with an accurate understanding of him and that accurate understanding of him leading to a response of praise, adoration, and worship towards him. Just an incredible understanding of how doxology comes from theology. And you can't have one without the other. To have one without the other is wrong. wrong. So we have now a working definition of doxology. Let's turn our attention to Psalm 117. It's two verses. It's the shortest chapter in the Bible. Let's read it. Praise the Lord, all nations. Extol Him, all peoples. Between Alan and I, we're going to make the word extol great again, okay? Uh, For great is His steadfast love toward us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. So, just surface level understanding of that text. You read the words. You know if you're going to try to find the main point of a text, you're going to try to figure out what is this text talking about, and you see the idea of praising the Lord three times, then you can conclude that the point of the text is to praise the Lord. Right? Right. Which is the title of today's sermon. We're going to praise the Lord. Now, what Psalm 117 lacks in length, it makes up for in depth. The same Holy Spirit who inspired a robust Thorough, Psalm 119, just two chapters later, which is the longest chapter in the Bible, also inspired this short doxology in Psalm 117. It's the shortest chapter in the Bible, but it captures the whole purpose and story of God's Word and His work in our world. And so the thing I want to kind of put before us today and just kind of leave before us today is this. All God's people praise the Lord for His steadfast love and faithfulness before all peoples. Okay, so we we praise the steadfast love and faithfulness of God before all mankind. We are showing who God is before all others. Now let's talk about what that means, okay? So in verse 1 we have, again, praise the Lord, all nations, extol Him, all peoples. Now, building on an understanding of praise, which I assume we all have kind of a basic understanding of what praise means, this word here means to boast or to commend. It means to brag. It means to just boast about the Lord, all nations. All nations, you should boast about the Lord. Everyone, you should boast or commend the Lord. You should praise the Lord. Amen? This is what the psalm is saying. It's praise that boast in the Lord. It's praise that commends the Lord. Extol essentially means the same thing, but to do it loudly and proudly. It's to do it with volume. It's to do it with joy, with excitement. It's to do it exuberantly. All right, there's another good word for us. Um, But extol captures so well what we're after here. So the psalmist is writing here, and he's writing to Israel, and he's saying, do not hide your praise for the Lord. Praise the Lord loudly. Praise Him proudly. Boast in His goodness. Do it in such a way that you are showing all peoples and all nations who exactly is your God. Now, what we don't want to do is quickly read over all nations or all peoples. Our understanding of the Old Testament should make us somewhat balk at that. We should stop for a moment and be like, whoa, wait a minute. You see, this is the Israel, these are the Israelites who are singing this. This is God's chosen people who are singing this. Now we know that when God chose a nation, he chose Israel in the beginning. He said, You will be my people. As he talks to Abraham, he says, I'm going to make of you great nations, though. All right? So here we have all nations are all peoples. And though it is the nation of Israel who originally sang this doxology, the purpose, 
was for the people, God's people, to have all nations sing this. That there would be such a movement of the glory of God throughout the world coming through the people of God that then all people would then turn themselves to the Lord and they would sing loudly and proudly along with the Israelites as God's people praise Him, extol Him. Its purpose was for people from all nations to sing it. In fact, God originally chooses Israel to be His people so that they would make known His glory in all the earth. This is what Deuteronomy 14 2 says, for you are a holy people to be, uh, sorry, for you are a holy people to the Lord your God. And the Lord has chosen you to be a people for his own possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. And first Peter, we have Peter writing saying that we are now, the church, a holy people, a royal priesthood chosen out of the world. We are in that vein the same as Israel. We are God's people. So when Israel would sing, praise the Lord all nations, extol him all peoples, they were simultaneously praising God for themselves and reminding one another of their mission to bring others into true Israel, that is into the people of God. Paul, near the end of Romans, makes this known. He cites Psalm 117.1, as he's explaining that this is the purpose of the gospel. He writes this, I'll read verses uh, 5 through uh, 13 for you. He says, May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the Lord and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. He goes on to explain why Jews and Gentiles should get on this way. He says, For I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised to show God's truthfulness, that is, to the Jewish people, in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs, and in, and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for His mercy, as it is written. Now he's quoting Scripture. Therefore I will praise you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. And again it is said, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with His people. And again, and this is Psalm 117.1, Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles are all nations, and let the peoples extol Him. This is Paul summing up Psalm 117.1 as he's explaining that Jews and Gentiles are together now. And again, Isaiah says, The root of Jesse will come, even he who arises to rule the Gentiles. In him will the Gentiles hope. In who? In Christ. All people find their hope in Christ. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. So now it is not only just hope that we find, it's hope that we abound in. This is wonderful. But wait! The way I grew up in church, the way I've heard things my whole life, isn't Israel some special people that still God is looking at and they're His people as like modern day Israel. Well, that is only true in so much as their hope is in Christ Jesus for their salvation. Now listen to me. Scripture teaches us that the true Israel, the Israel God always longed for, was satisfied in Jesus Christ. Here's Hosea 11.1. 1. This is the prophet Hosea speaking. He says, when Israel was a child, he's speaking on behalf of God. When Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. Well, I can tell you're not super excited about that yet. Let's keep reading. Uh, so that's the prophet Hosea speaking on behalf of the Lord through, about the birth of Christ. Now look at what Matthew says about the birth of Christ, concerning the birth of Christ, about this passage in Hosea 11. He says this, Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet out of Egypt, I called my son. So Matthew says that 
uh, Hosea 11.1 1 finds its meaning out of Egypt. I called my son, find its meaning in Christ Jesus, that he is true Israel. Now, there's a great article on Leganeer.org that sums this up quite nicely. It says this, he is the true Israel, the faithful Israel who succeeds where old covenant Israel failed. Like ancient Israel, he came up out of Egypt, passed through the waters, and was tested in the wilderness. Unlike old covenant Israel, however, Jesus passed the test. Praise God. He is therefore worthy to be called God's son because of who he is in his deity and because of what he accomplished in his humanity. Now, let me explain this. Christ being the true Israel is the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. If we are in Christ by faith, then we too share in the privileges that he enjoys with God the Father. All right? If we're in Christ, we share those same privileges with him. We are not sons by nature. We're not sons by nature, but neither was Israel sons by nature. There's many of them who fell away. They were sons by faith, and we too are sons by faith. We are sons by adoption. He, uh, Ephesians 1.5 says this, In love, God predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. So we have received that same adoption that uh, because of Christ, we've received, received the same inheritance that Christ has. We are now blessed in his beloved. We're blessed in the Son of God. The whole chapter of Romans chapter 4 consists of Paul explaining this new covenant of grace. He tells us that Abraham was not counted righteous because of his circumcision. In other words, you're not counted righteous because of your works. Praise God. You're not counted righteous because of your works. He says, so the Gentiles, uh, sorry, rather he was counted righteous by his faith. His faith came, Paul says, before his circumcision. It was his faith that made him righteous, not the circumcision. The circumcision was only a sign of the covenant. Now, all of that is important, Paul says, so that the Gentiles could be a part of the nations that God is saving and bringing unto himself to be his very own people. Look at the, the last couple of verses here of Romans 4. Read this way. But the words, it was counted to him, talking about the righteousness accounted to Abraham, it was counted to him, were not written for his sake alone. So not written just for Abraham to read, though I'm sure he loved knowing that. We love knowing that our faith is counted to us as righteousness, but it's written for ours also, Paul says. He says it will be counted to us, you, me, all who are after us, all who have gone before us, it will be counted to us who believe in him, who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Meaning that by the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ, if we place our faith in him, we are now justified. We are freed from the penalty of sin and death. And we are now alive in Christ Jesus by the Holy Spirit. And we live forevermore. Amen. Free of sin. Free of sin. I'm going to talk more about what that means for God's love in a moment. But if you believe in Jesus, then you are God's people. And as a result of being God's people, you should praise the Lord. Extol the Lord. Sing to Him. Pray to Him. Be happy in Christ. Be glad in Jesus. Do it for your own offering to God and do it so that you may lead others to praise the Lord also. He alone is worthy of our praise. He alone is worthy of our doxology and we do doxology because we understand who God is because of the scriptures and that's theology, right? So these things work together and now we praise God. God. Now, why should we praise the Lord? I've given some reason why, but I think the psalm here goes on to explain two major reasons why we should praise the Lord. Look at verse 2. 
For great is his steadfast love toward us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. In other words, what the psalmist is saying is this, for his loving or merciful kindness prevails over us, and his truth endures forever. Israel's reminding themselves of God's steadfast, merciful love. But it's not steadfast like a wall is steadfast. Like if I were to take off running across the stage, you all would enjoy this, no doubt. But if I were to take off running across the stage and run flat into that wall thinking I could get through it, I would be disappointed. You all would be totally thrilled, but I would be madly disappointed, right? Frustratingly so. Or take another example. I love medieval war movies. There's one in particular that I just, I, I can't get over. It's one of my favorites. It's called Kingdom of Heaven. And in it, uh, in most of these movies, there's a castle, there's a wall around the castle. But in this one particularly, there's a castle and a wall around the castle. And there's people in there that are being protected by this wall. That wall is steadfast. The whole point of hiding or taking shelter in that thing and firing arrows from the top of it is that it's really hard to penetrate, right? It's hard to get through that thing. This is why they build walls around cities. They're protecting themselves from the enemy. So God's love is steadfast. When I think steadfast, I think wall around a castle. It's protecting me. But, and it takes like a catapult or stones to kind of get through that thing, right? Like you're just not going to penetrate. I need something amazing to penetrate that love normally or to penetrate that wall normally. But that's not the kind of steadfast that Psalm 117 has in mind. To be sure, though, God's love is steadfast, and I'll share more on that in a moment. However, the point of Psalm 117 to A is that God's love is merciful, it is kind, and it is steadfast, and it says um, great is his steadfast love. That word great means it prevails. So walls don't necessarily prevail. They can prevail over an enemy. But what this has in mind is more like seeing the waves pummel my then six-year-old son last year while we were at Gulf Shores. That's the kind of steadfast, great steadfast love that Psalm 117 has in mind here, that it's an overflowing, overwhelming, it's prevailing over you steadfast love. It is literally pouring over the top of you. Ezekiel describes the Holy Spirit in the prophet, uh, the, the prophet book Ezekiel. He describes the Holy Spirit like a river. And he says this river flows forward out of the temple. And at first it's ankle deep. And then it gets to about knee deep. And then it's about waist deep. And then it's about chest height. And then it's overflowing over your heads. And then it's so strong that you cannot cross it. This is the Spirit of God in your own life. When you first receive the Lord, that Holy Spirit is there, and we would say that that's about ankle deep. Now, as you study about the Lord and you learn about the Lord, the Holy Spirit begins to prevail over you even more, and now you're about knee deep. It's not that the Holy Spirit is less or more in either instance. It's that your knowledge of God is growing. He is filling you up. And then as you study about the Lord more and more, it goes to waist deep and chest deep. And then before you know it, it's over your head and you're drowning in this love that God has given you. And, it, and Paul writes that it's the Holy Spirit that makes known to us the love of God. And this is that prevailing love of God overflowing on top of us. This is what Psalm 117 is talking about. And when you know God's love to be like a rushing river or a pummeling wave rather than a stone wall that you can't break through, it draws you in to praise the author of such love. Like, like you can't help it because you're being swept off your feet to do so. God alone is the author of that kind of love. And he reserves, listen to me, he reserves that love for those who place their faith in His Son. But when you place your faith in His Son, Jesus, the dam breaks. You're no longer swimming in ankle-deep water or trying to stay afloat in this ankle-deep water. The rivers of God's love come 
rushing through the Holy Spirit over your life, and nothing will stop it, not even a stone wall. Amen? This is God changing us. This is God transforming us into the likeness of Himself through His love. And when you do that, when you go to Christ, day in and day out, you go to your Scriptures, Lord, show me more of you today. I've got to have you. Day in, day out, week after week, year after year. You come to know Christ in a new way. The world's loves, all the, thing that the world, all the things that the world loves, those things begin to grow strangely dim in your eyesight. And you come alive to the light of His merciful love. And you want to swim in that. You want to praise Him for such love. So Israel is reminding themselves of God's love on one hand. On the other hand, they're reminding themselves of His faithfulness or that He is true forever. You see, God never changes. James writes and says, there's no shadow nor turning with God. We have the benefit of seeing what these Israelites could not see. We have the benefit of hearing what they could not hear. We have seen Christ. We can see Christ. We hear Him speak, and we see these things. We hear these things in God's Word. This is where we see Christ. This is where we hear Him speak. John 1 and Hebrews tell us that Christ is the exact imprint of the nature of God, that He is the glory of God revealed to us, that He is full of grace and truth. And so when we see Christ in the Scriptures, we see God. And we hear God speak when we hear it. When we listen to the Word of God, we're hearing the Lord. So Israel's reminding themselves of His faithfulness. He can be true forever. And we get to see Christ in a new way, in a way that they didn't. But here, let me explain to you what Israel's praising for. God keeps, and, and why we have reason to praise because of Christ, okay? Listen to this. God keeps His promise to Adam in Christ. Christ is the one who crushes the serpent's head. God keeps His promise to Noah in Christ. Christ is the one who redeems mankind from the punishment of sin by His own death. God keeps His promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in Christ, the one who brings all peoples from all nations into the family of God, as was promised to them. God keeps His promise to Moses in Christ, the true prophet of God, who is the very Word of God Himself, delivering the people out of the bondage of slavery into sin and into life eternal. God keeps His promise to David in Christ. Christ, the one whose kingdom will know no end. It will endure forever in the new heavens and new earth. And you better rest assured he is building his kingdom now. Christ is then the true and better Adam. Christ is the true and better Noah. Christ is the true and better Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Christ is the true and better Moses. He is the true and better David. Christ is the true and better prophet, priest, and king. In Jesus Christ, we have everything we need for salvation. Amen? He is the king who lays his life down for his people so that we can establish a new and better kingdom. Unlike David, who indulged himself in Bathsheba while he was supposed to be at war. He is the prophet who is the word himself. He gives life to all who believe his word. He is the priest who is also the lamb for the sacrifice. He went to the cross and paid our debt of death for us. If you will submit your life to his rule and to his word and to his sacrifice, then God will save you this day. He will save you today. Submit yourself to him and so therefore he is worthy of all the praise in this whole world and if you are currently extending any praise to anything without christ in view you are offering up at best jv level praise but varsity level praise knows that jesus is at the center of all that is good because god is the giver of all good things. And the best things come to us in Christ Jesus. 
Therefore, all God's people praise the Lord for his steadfast love and faithfulness before all peoples, before all the nations. Let me wrap this up. John says, God is love. The Apostle John writes, he says, God is love. God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit is love. Hebrews 13 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And Matthew 11 says, come to me. Come to me. Jesus says in Matthew 11, as the one who is the same yesterday, today, and forever, as the one who is himself love. Jesus looks into those who are weary and heavy laden with all their sin on their backs, that burden that you're carrying, that pain that you have. He looks straight into your eyes and he says, come to me, all of you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. All of this means that God's love never changes and that he offers it to anyone who will come to him. If you have already come to Christ and you have every reason in the world, you have all the reason you need to praise the Lord this morning. You know God's love in a saving way. But if you have not come to Christ, if you do not know Christ as your Lord, then I want you to know today you can make him Lord right now. He can be Lord of your life today. You just simply must repent of your sins. I mean, turn from your wickedness. Confess it and turn from it and turn to the Lord in faith. Turn to Him in faith. Faith in His life, faith in His death, faith in His resurrection. Commit your life to follow His teaching by hiding yourself in His sacrificial death and resurrection. That is where you will find rest from all of your striving today. Now, those who are in Christ, those who hide themselves in the Lord, this is what you get. You get God's faithfulness, a faithfulness that endures forever, truth that never ends, truth that is never out of style. Amen? And you get steadfast love from God the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, steadfast in that it prevails over you. Now, Paul writes about that faithfulness and love in Romans 8, 29 through 39. And let me just read this. I've read this passage uh, to us before, but we have to do it today. In Romans 8, 29, he says this, for those whom he foreknew, now this is going to talk about his faithfulness, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. This means God is at work in you from the beginning of your salvation all the way to the end of it. And you can count on the Lord above to make it happen. Philippians 1.6 says that he who began a good work in you is faithful to bring it to completion. He's faithful. But Paul responds this way to that idea. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who in the world could be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Paul's like, how in the world is this possible? But how in the world is it not possible? If God said it, it's done. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect, those who are found in his faithfulness? It is God who justifies. In other words, no man can say anything about whether you're saved or not. If you're hiding yourself in Christ, you are justified before God Almighty, and nothing changes that. Praise God. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. He's already bore all of our condemnation. Romans 8, 1 says there's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is enough, should be, to make us all kind of skyrocket out of this building this morning. This is amazing. God is amazing. 
Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died more than that, who was raised. He didn't stay dead, he's raised, amen? Who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us? So God is not, Jesus is not somehow just at the right hand of God. He's not some figurative thing up in the sky that we can't understand or know. Jesus sits before God the Father all the time interceding for you. That means he's pleading his justification over you, not in a way that like God's forgetting it. And like, hey, I'm going to smite him today. And Jesus is like, no, 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 no. No. It's Jesus declaring always the finished work of himself on the cross for your salvation. You are saved forevermore if you hide yourself in him. There is no sin that will condemn. There is no way that you will be cast out of the hand of God. John 10, Jesus says, I will in no wise cast him out whom the Father gives me. He is in my hand and nothing shall separate him. He's holding you. You're his. Ha! Ah! <laughs> Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or famine or distress or persecution or pandemics or coronavirus or nakedness or racism or danger or sword or accusations thereof? No, as it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things. All these things, tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, accusations, nakedness, COVID-19, danger, sword, and all these things, we are more than conquerors. Not just conquerors, more than conquerors through him who, what? Who loved us. You see, the very fact that God is love is the very reason you are more than a conqueror. It's because of his faithfulness and steadfast love, that prevailing, washing over you right now, love. <laughs> Paul just can't stop. This is doxology, by the way. He says, for I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come. So who knows what's around that corner just out there, right? None of that. None of that. Nor powers, nor height, nor depth or anything else in all creation. Nothing that God has created. Satan himself. Nothing that God has created will be able to separate us from the power of the love of God that is ours in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Listen. I think I've covered this well, but let me sum it up this way. If you were ever, if there was ever going to be a moment out there somewhere way beyond, maybe it's past this life to where you've hidden yourself in the Lord, your faith is in Him, you know Him as Lord, you're following Him. If there was going to be a moment somewhere out there where He would be like, nah, it was a good thought, then the gospel would not be good news. It would be terrible news because if it's not eternal good news, it's not good news. If at some point God's going to pull His love away from us, then that's not good news. But what Romans 8 tells us is that will never, ever, 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 I'll do like Bear does when he's trying to beat Wells on a number, 100 plus 2, right? It'll never, ever, ever, 100 plus 2 happen. It's not going to happen. It will never be that moment. And so, therefore, the gospel is good news for eternity. And that makes it overwhelmingly good news. Now, we need to sing. So if you notice, we sang two songs at the beginning. We're going to finish with three more songs. When you come to a text like this and you preach on the steadfast love and the faithfulness of God, you need to respond to that by singing to the Lord. So the team's going to come up now. I'm going to pray for you. Listen, we're going to do this because there are days where you simply need to remind yourself of the steadfast love and faithfulness of God by singing it out. So if you feel like maybe this isn't true for you or maybe this isn't right, I encourage you to sing anyway. If you can't sing for some reason, you're, you're just so down today or so messed up today, then, then pray. Ask God to give you the heart that wants to sing. Ask Him to restore to you the joy of, the, of His salvation or or to give it to you for the very first time. 
Listen, when you come to God, you are in no way going to be cast out. He welcomes you gladly. So today we're going to sing. Will you stand as I pray for you? Heavenly Father, we love you. We praise you. We thank you, Lord, for your word. My goodness, how amazing your word is. We know, Lord, that your spirit is with us now, that Jesus Christ is interceding on our behalf, and that, Father, you look on us as your own son. Whoa! What mercy, what faithfulness, undeserved, only described in a word that we call grace. And so we praise you today. We're going to glorify your name today. We're going to praise now. Lord, I pray now that you would hit the heart of every person here, that you would rush in with your prevailing love, that you would move us, Lord, to never see you the same way again, to never interact the same way again. Lord, move us to lay down our sins. Move us to lay down those temptations, those things that we hold on to, that we think we we just got to keep those around. Lord, move aside depression. Move aside anxiety and fear and doubt, worry. God, help us to glorify your name today. Pray that your spirit would wash us. Wash us, Father. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. If you have any questions after service, feel free to come talk with me. I'll be glad to visit with you. Amen. Let's sing.